It's apparent to me that every time man got into trouble on his own or by help, it was only then that he wanted to turn to God and ask for some relief. It is a shame that so many times that we don't, you know, we don't feel that closeness, we don't feel that that comfortable with coming to God in, in, a, in, a, in a way that we might if we were really under duress. When things are going well and everybody's doing good and I've never made more money in my life or never felt stronger in my life, never felt healthier in my life, it is then that I begin to feel very, very what? Independent. I do, and you do too. That's man's nature, isn't it? But it's whenever distresses come that we cry to Jehovah, oh God, I can't do this by myself, would you please? And that is a privilege that we have, and we should. We should. But then I want you to look. I'm going to write these down. You might want to underline them. Sorry about that. Psalms 107, verse 8, verse 15, verse 21, verse 31. Did you ever, do you do much memory work? But biblical memory work? I want to encourage you, if you don't, you need to start. Let me give you a shortcut to memory work, okay? This is a shortcut to memorizing. Read it a lot. Write it a lot. Say it a lot. It'll become yours. And then, whenever it's yours, use it a lot. See, if you memorize verse 8, you will already have verse 15, 21, and 31 memorized. He says, Oh, that men would praise Jehovah for his loving kindness and his wonderful works to the children of men. After they got into trouble, they said, Oh, God, please help us. Deliver us from this because we can't do it ourselves. He does. Then he says, oh, that you would remember where your salvation come from and all these blessings came from that was poured upon you. That you would praise Jehovah for his loving kindness and his wonderful works too. You know, my daddy, whenever I was a kid, whether we was uh, working on the combine, well, he had combines. We went north for several years going up to Montana, cutting wheat and everybody was in high school, junior high and high school. I started running combine when I was 12, full time for my dad. <coughs> Well, they're more complicated now. You know, I probably couldn't run one of them brand new ones now. You know, computerized. And all. I don't pewter much. You may be a pewter genius, but I can play solitaire. Anybody breaks into my information on there, it says lost, 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 lost. Sometimes I beat it, but not very often. That's all I can do with computers, play a game. I don't know how to get on the internet. I don't even know that I want on the internet. You know, they say any question you could ever think of is answered on the internet. Well, that's great. But see, the questions I'm interested in is biblical questions, and the Bible does it for me. You say, well, you know, you can read the Bible from the internet. I'm sure that's right. I can read the Bible in my solitude, just open it up and get in the book. But whenever he would tell me to go to the shop to get something, I'd take off about the time he said, go get. And I'd get about halfway there. He said, come here. And I'd run back. He said, what did I tell you to get? Well, you told me to get whatever. All right. And I'd go out there. And he made sure by his repeating what he wanted me to get. And my repeating that I would know what to give. By the same token, whenever this writer of the book of Psalms says over and over and over again, you think he's making a point. Oh, that men would praise Jehovah for his loving kindness, wonderful works to children of men. He's saying that to me. I mean, that's as, that's as relevant today as it was whenever it was written a long, long time ago. Has God been good to you? The Bible says in him we live, we move, we have our being. He giveth to all life and breath and all things. He holds my next breath in his hand. Now, I'm sure whenever I was a kid and I was playing ball and all that kind of stuff, I had more lung capacity. But if you asked me to hold my breath for two minutes, I'd say, no, -uh. I can't do that anymore. If he withheld our breath in here for two and a half minutes, we'd all be panicking, I guarantee you. Every good gift, the Bible says, every perfect gift 
comes down from the Father of lights, with whom there is no variation, neither shadow cast by turning. James 1.17. Every good thing that you've experienced in this life came from God. Love, mercy, kindness, forgiveness, grace, all these things are God's attributes. He that loveth not what? What's the Bible Knoweth not God. For God is what? Love. God is love. He is love. We turn over to 2 Peter 3 and verse 9. He says, uh, um, God does not, uh, what is it? It says, God does not count slackness. Uh, I'll say to my first Peter. Second Peter 3, verse 15. Say again. No. Maybe. Help me out here. You got it? The Lord is not slack concerning his promises, as some men count slackness, but is long suffering to us, we're not willing that any should perish, that all should come repentance. So we're talking about what? The long suffering of God. He don't want you to go to hell. He don't want me to go to hell. He gave me time. Let me tell you something. I obeyed the gospel in 1966. Went to Sunset 1967. Graduated in 1969. Been preaching ever since. Preached all the way through Sunset in a little congregation out there in the country from Lubbock. I thank God that He allowed me to do that. You know what? I could have been in hell already for over 40 years. I could have already been there for 40 years. Because I had not learned the truth. Did not know the truth. Had not obeyed the truth. I thank God that He let me live. You ought to all say, I thank God that He let me live long enough to hear, believe, and obey the truth. What a blessing. What a blessing. We need to praise Jehovah for His loving kindness and His wonderful works to the children of men. We came together today to praise God. There's no doubt about it. Do you know you get to thinking about, well, you know, I owe Him my life. I owe him not only my physical life, but I owe him my spiritual life. The Bible says we are his workmanship created in Christ Jesus unto good works. Ephesians 2 and verse 10. We're his workmanship. God doesn't make junk. Whenever he took you and refashioned you into what he wanted you to be, he didn't make any junk. He made things and people and minds and abilities to be able to praise him upon this earth and be able to serve him effectively. I don't care how old we are. The Bible describes old people as wine, skin, and spot. You know what I think of whenever I see wine? I don't see it. But if I think about a wine, skin, and smoke, I think of something all crinkly and brittle and cold. Then he talks about those who are full of sap and green. Older folks, full of sap and green. Well, I had a knee replaced about what, three years ago or something like that. I don't get around like I used to. I get around better. I mean, my knee was killing me. Some of you may have had a knee replaced. But do I bend over and pick up stuff? Good? No, I sometimes fall over on my head. Just cram my hat down on top of my head wherever I've been in a restaurant where I'm over my head. I don't know what that is. Dizziness, I guess. I'm not as limber as I used to be, but I'm still full of sap and green. I'm still alive in Christ Jesus. I'm still able to be used by Him. And so are you. I don't care how old we are or how young we are. If we're old enough to obey the gospel, we can be used by Him to His glory. And that's what we're going to do. I want you to turn over to 116. Psalms 116. Read with me verses 12 and 13. Whenever we get to think about it, what does God have or what do I have that God needs? I mean, he doesn't need a Walmart credit card. Uh, he doesn't need money. Everything belongs to him. Everything good. What in the world do I have that he wants? If I'm going to praise Jehovah for his loving kindness and wonderful works of the children of men, he tells me right here how to do it. Beginning in verse 12, look what he said. What shall I render unto Jehovah for all of his benefits toward me? Is that not like saying, Oh, that men would praise Jehovah for his loving kindness, wonderful works, children? Yes, same, same thing. 
What shall I render unto Jehovah for all his kindness? Then he answers the question. Look what he said. I know what I'll do. I mean, he doesn't say that. But this is what he assumes. This is what he does. I will take the cup of salvation. What a meal. God is always offering it. The cup of salvation. I want you to write this down. I want to give you an assignment. Can I give you an assignment? I want you to memorize Colossians chapter 3, verses 1 through 4. Do yourself a favor and memorize those four verses. They're not long. It won't take you long. Remember what I said? Read it a lot. Write it a lot. Say it a lot. If you can remember a telephone number or your address, you can remember scripture. I believe it. But it says in Colossians chapter 3 and verse 1 through 4, if you've been raised together with Christ, the word if is a fulfilled condition. So what it's saying is, since you've been raised together with Christ, we're talking about from the water and grave of baptism, since you've been raised together with Christ, <clears throat> seek those things that are above. Set your affections on things above, not upon things that are upon the earth, for you died and your life is now hid with Christ in God. But when Christ, who is your life, shall be manifest, then shall you be manifest with Him in glory. What is my manifestation with Him in glory contingent upon? What does it say? When Christ becomes my life. My reason for getting up in the morning. My reason for sitting down and resting and eating. My reason for sitting at meat at three times a day, whether I need it or not. <coughs> the Bible says, whatsoever you do in word or deed, do all in the name of the Lord Jesus, giving praise to Him to the Father, through Him to the Father. The Bible also says, whether you eat or drink, do all the glory of God. Everything we do, we need to do it to His glory. But He's given me some instruction there about what I ought to do. Now I want you to write this down too. You cannot possibly come in contact with the blood of Christ without coming in contact with the water of baptism. Here's the reason. Remember what I said this morning? I said uh, uh, reason plus revelation. And I said you can't have reason until you have rationality. And rationality says you'll only come to such conclusions as the evidence warrants. That's true. That's true. I don't care if it's law enforcement or whatever it is. That's a fact. Mathematics, English, grammar. But listen to what it says. Matthew 26 and verse 28. Jesus takes the cup. I'm sure he holds it aloft and says, This is the blood of my of the new covenant, which is shed for many for what? Remember what it says? The remission of sins. This cup, which was representative of his blood, was shed for the remission of sins. Turn over to Acts 2 verse 38, and it says, Repent and be baptized, everyone, in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ. For the remission of sins, and you shall receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. Baptism is for the remission of sin. The blood is for the remission of sin. You can't contact the blood without getting in the water. That's a fact. You turn over to Acts 22 and verse 16. He says, Saul, my terrorist, thou rise and be baptized, and wash away thy sins, calling upon the name of the Lord. Then I whip over to, to Revelation 1 and verse 5, and it says, Who loved us and washed us from our sins in his own blood. He said, Baptism washes your sins away, Saul. He said, the blood washes your sins away to all of us. Those who want to go to heaven by bypassing the baptistry or pond or a deep enough pool in the creek are not going to go to heaven. They've never contacted the blood. It's impossible to have your sins washed away without being baptized. Impossible. People need to be told that. People need not trust in lies and think that belief only will save you. James 2 and verse 24, he says, By works is a man justified, and not by faith only. The only place in the New Testament faith only is written, and it's preceded by not by. Isn't that something? And people will tell you, your friend, my friend, you're saved by faith only. A lie. 
a lie dressed up like the truth. Because it's not the truth. So he says, number one, I will drink from the cup of salvation. He made it available. He wants you to pick it up and turn it up and consume this salvation. Drink from the cup of salvation. Look what he says in verse 13. I will take the cup of salvation and call upon the name of Jehovah. How many people do you know that believe that all you got to do is say, Lord, save me, and it's a done day? You ever heard of anything like that? I used to watch a TV evangelist tell people, hey, you there at the bar, put the beer down. Watch the TV, look at the TV. All you've got to do right there, sitting on that bar stool, is ask God to save you, and he will. And there's quite a lot of people bought into that. That's real simple, isn't it? Is it the truth? It's not the truth. I will call upon his name. I want you to know that in uh, Joel 2 and verse 32, it says, It shall come to pass in the last days that whosoever shall call upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. You turn over to Acts chapter 2, beginning in verse 21, and he quotes from Joel 2, verse 31, and he says, In the last days it shall come to pass that whosoever shall call upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. Now look, look at it. Now who's speaking there? Who is the speaker in Acts chapter 2? The Apostle Peter. He stood up with the other eleven. Didn't he? And he tells them about Jesus Christ who died for the sin, shed his blood so that they might have salvation and all that kind of thing. And then he turns to them and with a pointed finger, I'm sure, he says, and you who have taken and crucified the Son of God. And the Bible says they were pricked in their hearts and they said, men and brethren, what should we do? A strange, very strange question. He just got through saying in verse 21, call upon the name of the Lord and you shall be saved. Why are they asking now, what shall we do? It was almost in the same paragraph. So what are they really asking? How do I call? How do I call? Would that make sense to you? Instead, instead of saying just, he's already called him to call upon the name. Now they're asking, what shall we do? So they're saying, how do we call he tells them in verse, Acts chapter 2, verse 38, Repent and be baptized, every one of you, in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ, for the remission of sin, you shall receive the gift of the Spirit. He's saying, Obeying the gospel is how you call for salvation. It's not just saying, Lord, because I've got a, I've got a, a man in Acts chapter 10 on the way to Damascus, and a bright light shone down around him, and a voice out of that light said, Saul, Saul, why persecutest thou me? It's the Lord Jesus talking to him. In this light, why persecutest thou me? What does what is, what is Saul of Tarsus say then? Lord, call upon his name. What would you have me to do? He's already putting himself in subjection to the Lord. I ask you a question. <coughs> was he saved? Was he saved on the road whenever he called Jesus Lord? No. He said, you go into the city of Damascus, to a street called Straight. And you shall be told what you must do. So he goes to the street called Straight. Now listen to what Ananias says to him. Saul, my terrorist thou, arise and be baptized, and wash away thy sins, calling on the name of the Lord. It's not just a verbally saying, Lord. It's doing what he says. That's how you call upon his name. I turn over to Acts, or Romans chapter 10. What is it, 13 to 14? It says, It shall come to pass in the last days that whosoever shall call upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. Then he asked the question, How shall they call on him in whom they have not believed? And how shall they believe on him in whom they have not heard? And how shall they hear without a preacher? As it is written, How beautiful are the feet of those that bring glad tidings of good things. He's talking about the original proclamation of the truth there. He's not talking about it today. The original proclamation of the truth before all of this was written down. They went forth teaching everywhere, from house to house, and in the synagogue. Daily in the temple, there was teaching about Jesus Christ, the original proclamation of the gospel. So I can't take that and say, oh, you can't know the truth unless I tell you because I can preach. No. Anybody can teach anybody the truth. Can't they? All we got to do is do it.
So all these passages of Scripture tell me how to call upon the name of the Lord. It's not just saying Lord. It's obeying the gospel. I one time, whenever I was at Melrose the first time, I moved out to Melrose in Mexico in 1971, stayed there in 1976, moved to Garland, Texas, preached for the Broadway congregation in Garland, Texas, and then we started the new congregation in Broward, Texas. And Johnny Ramsey was real good to me. We both uh, filled the pulpit. He would half everything with me. Sunday mornings, I'd get half the class. He'd take half the class. Uh, Sunday night, I'd preach the lesson. He'd preach on Sunday morning. And then on Wednesday night, we'd have to begin. I mean, you know, he'd have to do that. He was a located man. One of the greatest gospel preachers I've ever heard. As much Bible as you would ever want to hear. Come on, He was good for you. The Lord used it mightily. But anyway, I don't even know where I was going with that. You know, I need to take notes in the pulpit instead of taking notes to the pulpit. Because I'll start illustrating something. And I'll think, what was that? I, will, I had something good to tell you. And I can't remember it now. Call upon the name of the Lord. I want you to look at verse 14. What does he say? He says, I will pay my vows unto Jehovah, yea, in the presence of all his people. Did you ever make a promise to God? It's a serious thing. You turn over to Ecclesiastes chapter 5, verses 4 and 5. It says, If you vow a vow to Jehovah, defer not to pay it, for he hath no pleasure in food. It'd be better that you didn't vow than to vow and not pay. I wasn't a Christian when my children were born. I went to didn't get to go in the uh, what, delivery room. They didn't let us guys in there back from there. My kids being born, probably the best. I thought they fell over and knocked all the stuff over. But anyway, I'd always promised God while she was in there in labor, I said, if you would just let her and that baby be all right, I'll start going to church. As soon as they come out and said, wife is doing fine, you got a fine baby boy twice and a fine baby girl the third time. And I forgot about that promise I made to God. I'd go to church. Yeah, I did. That's that? I didn't realize the gravity of making a promise to God. And I, but I wasn't even a Christian. I wasn't even a child of God. I couldn't even call God Father. Let me tell you something. Only God's children could call Him Father. I've only had three kids in all of humanity be able to call me Dad. I don't have any more. Three. That's all. And only the sons of God can say Father. Just something. Why would a person miss that through life? Not to have God as your Father. Whenever I was taught the truth, I was taught also that I need to be faithful unto death. Let me tell you something. Throughout history, the offended party always sets the rules of reconciliation to the offender. Isn't that true? Sometimes we even call in a third person, you know, to witness this thing. To make sure everything's all right, according to Hoyle, and all that sort of business. God was the offended Otho Rogers was the offender. God said, you have to obey the gospel to be saved. You have to be faithful until death to acquire your salvation. I accepted those rules of reconciliation, and by doing so, I swore to him I'd do it. If you accepted those rules of reconciliation, you too made a promise to God. Not only would you obey the gospel, you'd be faithful unto death. That's an important thing. It's a very important thing. You know what is sad? It doesn't bother anybody much anymore. It doesn't cause a lump in their throat or tears in their eyes or anything. But you know, we'll have, where I, where I preach, we have about 120 goats in a town of about 720. But we won't have 120 for Sunday night. Does that bother y'all? It bothers me. Whenever I get callous to the fact that, no, you can't get them out for every service. And I get to believe in that. And I'm believing wrong. I believe we ought to be there for every service, don't you? If you want to go fishing Sunday morning, and I see you going down the 
the, the road toward the lake, and you've got, I didn't turn this thing on, did I? You hear me all right? Can y'all hear me all right back here? Yeah. I'm sorry. That's all right. Have y'all been hearing me back here okay? I'm glad. But let me meet you on Sunday morning, knowing that you're supposed to be in church, and you're going to the lake, and I see your fishing pole. That bothers me. That really bothers me. See, I really expect, I don't have any behavior this morning, but I really expect everybody to be back tonight. I do. Don't you? I expect it. You know, you might have things already planned that you can't be, but boy, this week, I want y'all back and I want you to bring somebody with you. I hope you will. Because you see, I told God I'd be faithful. Until then, whenever I accepted his rules for reconciliation. I want you to turn with me over to Judges chapter 11. Judges chapter 11.
First Peter chapter two. Several times it said, "Spare not the ancient world, spare not the angels that sin, cast them down the pits of darkness, reserve them to judgment until the day of judgment." He is an unsparing God. To whom? To those who do not His will. To those who don't care. To those who promise and break. It. It's a serious thing. And whenever I said yes, Father, I want to obey Your gospel, and yes, I want to be faithful to the death. I owe Him to do that very thing. This man took his vow seriously. And it's recorded and preserved for me. Thank you. So what will we do with that which we've learned today? Oh, that men would praise Jehovah for his loving kindness. His wonderful works to children. I'll tell you what we'll do. We will drink from the cup of salvation. We'll call him his name. We'll keep our vow. Promise to it. How about you today? Have you drank from the cup of salvation? Have you called upon his name in a New Testament way for salvation? Are you keeping your promises? It's important, you know. If you're here this morning, you're subject to invitation. Won't you please do what you need to do today?